So we welcome very much Professor Michelle Ye. Uh, her Chinese name is uh, Xi Mi, which is actually a bit different, but uh, that sometimes happens with Chinese names when they get transliterated. She was born and raised in Taiwan and uh, received her PhD in comparative literature at the University of Southern California and for many years now is a distinguished professor and chair at the Department of East Asian uh, Languages and Cultures at the University of California at Davis, which is located in the city Davis, so if you don't know that, <laughs> um, close to San Francisco. And she's a very well-known, one can, really can say a world-renowned scholar and translator of modern poetry in Chinese language, in particular Taiwanese poetry, but also from other uh, regions. And she has published a lot of books, more than a dozen monographs, uh, more than a hundred articles, and many, many hundreds translations uh, from Chinese poems mostly, but also prose stories, essays, uh, into English language. And a very important uh, book she did is an anthology of modern Chinese poetry, which is entitled Frontier Taiwan. And uh, she um, is also very significant in the, in, the, in the United States for being one of the few places where there is actually a focus on Taiwanese literature and culture. This is some, um, um, the same thing actually here in Europe. We, in Trier, we try to build up something sort of like that, but we aren't that far enough. But that is uh, really important. Um, uh, as you all know, uh, there has been more and more um, significance of what, of what is happening in Taiwan. So that has also a, a great contemporary value. So that's uh, all for of my brief introduction for now. And uh, uh, Michelle, the floor is, is yours. And I'm looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you very much for the um, introduction, Professor Sofal. And I really want to start out by saying what an honor it is to address this international group of colleagues and friends. And uh, I always feel a little embarrassed when people introduce me, <laughs> especially reading off a list of publications, because I always feel I am still in the process of learning, learning about uh, modern Chinese poetry, obviously, but also other uh, related areas, as well as translation. I never see myself as a professional <laughs> translator, but I guess after decades of having translated some poetry, both classical and modern, um, people do see me as a translator. But again, I want to emphasize that I am learning from my um, esteemed colleagues in the field. And today is no exception. I really look forward to our discussion after my presentation. Uh, I, I hope to um, find inspirations um, from your comments. Um, and I want to say that the uh, presentation I'm giving today is based on the introduction to a new anthology of modern Chinese poetry that I'm co-editing uh, with a professor from Nanjing University, Li Zhangbing and Frank Stewart uh, at the University of Hawaii, who is also the editor of Manoa, uh, the literary magazine. Uh, so with that, um, I again, I hope to um, complete my introduction following this presentation and discussion. Uh, so any ideas you have for me would be greatly appreciated. So now let me share screen with my um, PowerPoint uh, here. So, okay, there. So um, why modern Chinese poetry is the title. And I you notice that I've added a few words to the subtitle. Originally it was uh, challenges and opportunities, but now I have added renewal of tradition. I think this is especially relevant to our discussion uh, later on uh, with those colleagues here who specialize in classical Chinese poetry. Uh, and I do want to um, emphasize that, that modern Chinese poetry, no matter how radical it seems and is, is actually also a form of a renewal of the Chinese poetic tradition. So I'm gonna start off with a brief overview of the introduction of modern Chinese poetry to the West through English translation. 
due to my own limitations, I can only talk about English translations of modern Chinese poetry, and mainly I'm referring to North America uh, and Britain. Okay, so of course we all know that the classical Chinese poetry was introduced to the West very early on. And in the 19th century, especially, I think classical Chinese poetry became quite popular, mainly through the efforts of these two uh, translators, Arthur Whaley and Ezra Pound. And uh, no need for me to go into um, these two luminous translators and poets. Uh, but in terms of modern Chinese poetry, we really have to wait until 1936, when the first anthology of modern Chinese poetry in English translation was published in London. Uh, and it was co-edited and translated by Harry Acton and Shishang Chen. And you see the pictures here. Um, Harry Acton, some of you may know his work. He's a British author. Uh, and collector. In fact, today, if you go to Italy, you can visit the Acton collection at Villa La Pietra, uh, which houses 6,000 objects, including Chinese porcelain. So he taught at Peking University in, oops, I'm gonna shrink this part of the screen so I can see the entire slide. Okay, so he was teaching at Peking University uh, 1932 to 1939, and he actually purchased a house in old Peking. And uh, Chen Shishang was one of his students. And also through Chen, he met quite a few young poets. Uh, and that's how they got the idea of translating the poetry into English. And so, the reason I um, talk about this collection, not only because it was very first English anthology of modern Chinese poetry, but also because of the sort of genealogy of modern Chinese poets here. Because Chen Shishang went on to teach at UC Berkeley for years before his untimely death. And just here you see two pictures, Chen Shishang with his good friend T.A. Sha, who was the elder brother of C.T. Sha. And we know a lot about T.A. Shah's work. Um, and also Chen recruited a PhD student into the comparative literature program at UC Berkeley. And his name was C.H. Wang or Wang Jingxian, but better known under his pen name, Yang Mu, who I consider one of the greatest modern Chinese poets, if not the greatest. Um, so that's why you see this genealogy here. And of course, Yang Mu went on to influence one to three generations of poets in Taiwan and beyond. And then the second collection of uh, modern Chinese poetry was published in 1947. So there's quite a gap here uh, from 1936 when uh, Acton and Chen's collection came out. But it was also published in London and it was edited by Robert Payne, a British diplomat in China. And it was actually a collaboration with Wen Yiduo, one of the most important modern poets. But by this time, of course, Wen has stopped writing modern poetry and devoted himself to classical scholarship. And he was teaching at Southwest Association University in Kunming, Yunnan province. And uh, so they were working on this collection. And I think most of the selections were actually determined by Wen since he was much more familiar with the poetry scene in China. Unfortunately, in 1946, he was assassinated. Um, it's widely uh, believed that he was assassinated by the Kuomintang, the nationalist government for his uh, dissenting views. So he didn't get to see the publication of the collection, even though his um, credit was clearly acknowledged in the book. But again, it's speaking of the genealogy of modern Chinese poets, when Yi Duo taught a student at Southwest Associated University in China, his name was Kai Yu Xu, who went on to teach at San Francisco State University in the US, and there he, uh, edited this important anthology, the most comprehensive anthology of modern Chinese poetry up to that point, published in 1963, 20th century Chinese poetry. And even today, I think this book is still highly valuable. And Xu unfortunately um, died in an accident um, in 1982. Uh, but as I said, we're still reading his anthology. And also, by the way, the reason I posted his picture here is that to 
to commemorate his dear teacher at Southwest um, Associate University when you do, he um, grew this beer uh, that looks just like his teachers. And then the Cold War era, besides uh, Kai Yushu's collection, I want to single out these two important collections, one edited by Wylin Yip uh, and uh, the other Modern Verse from Taiwan by Angela Young Plendry. So both collections are devoted to poetry from Taiwan. And there is a reason for it because during the Cold War era, it was impossible for scholars uh, to do research in China, uh, which was closed off to the West. Therefore, they would go to Taiwan as sort of a miniature China, sort of microcosm of China. So not only humanists, that is uh, translators uh, and humanist scholars, but also social scientists would do their field work in Taiwan, which is kind of interesting that Taiwan became a substitute for mainland China during this period of time. And then as China opened up in the uh, late 1970s, soon we saw this um, influx of, uh, of translations. Uh, and uh, this is not a comprehensive list by any means. So I apologize for leaving out any um, books um, on this list, but this just gives you an idea as to the many anthologies that started to come out in the 1980s and 90s. And this continued to grow into the 21st century. Again, I apologize if it's not a comprehensive list. And uh, this situation I think will probably uh, remain uh, as we uh, develop uh, this field. In other words, there will be a lot of mythologies and collections of individual poets, which brings me to the next slide. Um, that is not just books, but also journals in the English speaking world uh, have published a lot of modern Chinese poetry, mainly uh, contemporary Chinese poetry in translation. And here you just see a few examples, but really a large number of journals uh, have published Chinese poetry in translation. And also what is very um, noteworthy is that not just anthologies, uh, which are general collections, but individual collections have, uh, have come out in growing numbers in recent years, I think the last 10 years or so, but also in the coming years, we will see a lot more coming out. And this is just a partial list of Chinese poets whose works have been translated into English. And for um, my colleagues in the field, you can uh, identify these poets, maybe all of them, maybe some of them. Okay, I try to um, have a balanced uh, representation here of poets from mainland China, Taiwan, and Hong Kong, and different generations of poets. So um, then I want to move on because the translation of modern Chinese poetry really serves as a segue to uh, translation and modern Chinese poetry, because translation itself has played such a crucial role in the development of modern Chinese poetry since its beginning. Uh, so here I use uh, two examples. Well, first of all, Ezra Pound, of course, we know his translation of classical Chinese poetry, uh, but actually he has also had an influence on modern Chinese poets. Uh, but what he says about translation strikes me as um, very important. Translation is likewise good training. If you find that your original matter waffles when you try to rewrite it, the meaning of the poem to be translated cannot wobble. I think it's such a good lesson for me as a translator, but also for most modern Chinese poets, uh, they also translate poetry from various languages. Um, German, French, English, and Japanese, and so on. So anyway, I think this really um, bears remembering. Uh, and a concrete example is that at the very beginning of modern Chinese poetry, Hu Shi, the father of modern Chinese poetry, translated Sarah Teasdale's Over the Roofs uh, in 1919. So that's only two years after Hu Shi promoted the idea of new poetry or modern poetry. And Sarah Teasdale today, no one would say she is a major American poet. However, this is how comparative literature works. It doesn't have to be that kind of equivalence um, and maybe something we can talk about later on. Uh, 
But Hu Shi acknowledged that this translation was very important for him. And he even said that the translation uh, ushered in a new epoch in new poetry. So Xu Zhimo, I think this passage I really uh, um, understand and agree with. That is that he actually sent out a call for submissions of translated poetry uh, to Fiction Monthly uh, when he was editing it um, for that issue. He says translation is a way is a way to explore new possibilities of refined thoughts and measured cadence. And here he's talking about exploring the elasticity and resilience of this newly discovered tool of expression after the liberation of the Chinese language. So this is very interesting. In other words, uh, the newly discovered tool of expression is modern Chinese, the modern vernacular, which replaced the classical Chinese uh, as the medium of poetry uh, with new poetry and, uh, and also the idea that we need to explore the elasticity and resilience, the really the infinite possibility. And this is one point I will um, say more about later on. Whoops. But to understand the uh, uniqueness of modern Chinese poetry, we really have to know the significance of poetry in Chinese civilization as a whole. So we have to go back to the long glorious tradition of classical poetry. So here we have classical poetry and early on Confucius, the most important philosopher in Chinese civilization, already put an emphasis on poetry, reading poetry. And he was the um, attributed editor of the first collection of Chinese poetry, uh, Shi Jing Book of Songs or Classical Poetry. Uh, and uh, classical poetry was considered a cornerstone of moral cultivation, an essential part of education, uh, but also it taught one how to interact with other people, uh, how to know the world, how to observe society and so on. So very early on, uh, Confucius believed that poetry was an essential part of education. Uh, and uh, by the third century BC, uh, Confucianism was established as the state orthodoxy. So the Confucian canon was the core of the curriculum for, uh, for anyone who was seeking an education. So the Confucian canon actually begins with, with poetry the book of songs or classic poetry that I mentioned earlier. In other words, poetry comes first in the Confucian canon. This is how important it is. And, uh, and then also as the civil service examination system matured by the sixth or seventh century, poetry was one of the subjects um, for the exams. And again, if you wanted to succeed on the exam, uh, then you will have to master poetry. Okay. So my conclusion is that in the classical or in traditional China, poetry is consequential. It really matters. Okay. Uh, in many different spheres, um, educational, moral, social, political, and of course, cultural. And in terms of culture, we know that with Confucianism as the backbone of Chinese society, and Chinese civilization, there is a long tradition of literati culture, these highly educated uh, literary men okay, uh, who also serve in the government as scholar officials. And, they, and, and this is a very elegant culture, right? That emphasizes poetry, calligraphy, and painting. These three arts tend to go together for obvious reasons, right? Because poetry is written in calligraphy and poetry often appears on paintings, as you can see here. And the one on the, the upper left-hand corner is a very typical uh, picture of literati culture, right? Here you have two scholars playing music, sitting in nature, possibly talking about poetry and philosophy and so on. Okay, so let's move on here. But also I want to emphasize uh, that poetry, yes, a classical poetry was written by and for members of the elite. However, it is not uh, an elite art, but rather it is a form of popular art, I would say, or public art in multimedia. 
as you can see here, it's carved, it's inscribed, it's painted, it's embroidered, right? Um, so all the uh, different media, but also different forms, um, just about anything uh, around, uh, around you in daily life, you can find some kind of uh, poetry quoted. Uh, so in these forms. Now I want to move on in contrast, in contrast to the importance uh, of poetry in traditional China into the, the early 20th century, we've seen this uh, radical change as a result of structural, uh, structural um, changes. That is the abolition of the civil service examinations in 1905. That means that poetry no longer had any political role to play. And then the end of monarchy, the founding of the Republic of China, 1912, uh, that of course means that uh, politically is, is a different world and uh, poetry because of the new education system also began to play a diminished role, uh, but other aspects as well, even material culture is it's, um, in terms of people's daily lives, uh, it was a different world and poetry seemed to play a lesser role in this modern world. So the consequences are the loss of poetry's political, educational, social roles and the loss of its prestige. The two go together, of course. Uh, and, and at the same time, I think an equal, equally strong, uh, maybe even greater challenge facing modern poetry in the early 20th century was classical poetry. This, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the importance of classical poetry in Chinese civilization. And I think that gave rise to what I call fetishization of classical poetry. Even today, when Chinese people talk about how proud they are of poetry, they are really talking about classical poetry, right? They can cite Li Po and Du Fu and many others. And, and there are reasons for that phenomenon. Uh, one is what I call sedimentation of classical poetry in the Chinese language, both spoken and written. It doesn't take a scholar to use uh, poetry, classical poetry um, in their daily use, whether in their speeches or in their writings. Okay, so there's such a deep um, part of Chinese language that's being shaped by classical poetry. And the second point is naturalization of the classical paradigm. Um, that is in terms of literary paradigm. Uh, and because of thousands of years of classical poetry, because of its uh, centrality in Chinese society and culture, uh, people have accepted the paradigm that's embedded in classical poetry. Of course, you can say there's a whole diversity. There's a variety of classical poetry is not all the same. However, I will argue by saying that the dominant paradigm in classical poetry as preserved in masterpieces. I mean, that paradigm has been naturalized. That is, Chinese readers tend to expect that kind of poetry when they, when they read poetry. And the consequences are poetry, modern poetry tends to be seen as strange and foreign. Of course, you can say after a century of development poetry, modern poetry has been accepted a lot more than in the early 20th century. But in general, I would say modern poetry in comparison to classical poetry is seen as strange and foreign. It's not indigenous, right? It is not classical. And then um, at the same time, there has been a criticism of the cultural identity of modern Chinese poetry. So two questions have been posed basically. It is poetry because it's so different from classical poetry. And it is Chinese poetry because it seems so foreign. So these I will talk about briefly later on. Um, but what I want to turn to is really the, uh, the advantages of modern poetry. That is, first of all, we have seen that modern poetry draws on many new literary and philosophical resources, what I would call translated modernity. It doesn't have to be translation in a literal sense, but I think one way or another, it is translated, right? So um, first of all, this, these pictures, I'm sure you can identify 
some if not all of the, the major poets here, and they have all exerted a significant influence on modern Chinese poets, right? Some of them study abroad, for instance, they study in France, in Germany, and the United States, and the, uh, the United Kingdom, and so on, but mainly through reading, right? Sometimes through translation. So, so this is one aspect of translated modernity, but uh, also many of the poets, as I just mentioned, study abroad and they knew the languages. Uh, and so they could read the originals. Uh, and, and what I call the false dichotomy, going back to the uh, questions that um, some critics of modern Chinese poetry have posed, right? Is this poetry, is this Chinese poetry? I think it's a false dichotomy to say Chinese is diametrically opposed to Western, right? China and the West, but also tradition versus modernity. And this I will um, sort of clarify, but in a way, um, what critics have refused to accept sometimes is that even though modern Chinese poetry is written in Chinese, they say it's not Chinese. Uh, so even at a commonsensical level, it doesn't make sense to me, but, but also it has something to do with the, the perception of the Chinese poetic tradition that is it's a, a stagnant thing. It is homogeneous, that it doesn't change, it doesn't grow. And that's exactly where I think modern Chinese poetry has made a significant contribution, which we'll talk about some more. Um, first of all, I don't think it's that dichotomy, but rather we're really looking at native responses to foreign stimulation, in other words, Chinese responses to world stimulations, right? All the resources that I mentioned earlier, there is a process of transplantation and naturalization. I guess I have used the word naturalization many times already, but this is, seems to me a key to understanding um, modern Chinese poetry, that it doesn't stay the same, right, forever. Classical poetry never stayed the same. Right, it kept growing and developing, maybe not in a linear fashion, um, but it's, it still changed. It still changed. Um, so let me go on here. What is modern about modern Chinese poetry? This question always interests me a lot more about what is Chinese about modern Chinese poetry, even though I know some people disagree with me. Um, that has been my focus, right? So in terms of what is modern about modern Chinese poetry, some of these adjectives we can use to describe it, iconoclastic, deconstructive, emancipatory, innovative, experimental, original. As you can see from the pictures, I mean, I picked these paintings um, really um, carefully because I wanted to show how they are both. They are both traditional, that is traditionally Chinese and modern, right? Innovative, that is, and original. Okay, so if we look at modern Chinese poetry, it has actually gone beyond literature to play a significant role in modern Chinese history. That is, it has played the role of the vanguard uh, in, in several instances. For instance, new poetry uh, in the May 4th era in the 1910s uh, and 20s and uh, because new poetry uh, really was the first to um, usher in modern Chinese literature. It was uh, the most uh, radical call for reform. Uh, and then some of these um, original collections of modern Chinese poetry, Fu Shi's Experiments was the first collection of modern Chinese poetry. Um, and then, uh, Goddesses is by Guo Morua, another milestone in the history of modern Chinese poetry, and the Wild, Wild Grass by Lu Xun, uh, another first, that is the first collection of prose poems in Chinese. So let's move on here. And then in the 1950s and 60s, uh, I think that we, we saw modernism thriving in Taiwan and Hong Kong, and it was the first among the various art forms to, to uh, launch modernism in post-war Taiwan and Hong Kong. And painting came along with poetry. And this is an interesting historical phenomenon that is usually poetry and painting go together, right? Whereas fiction, drama, 
may be uh, separate in terms of their trajectory. And uh, so here you see the Modern Chinese Quarterly uh, founded by Ji Xian in Taiwan, um, followed by the Epoch Poetry Journal uh, in 1954. In Hong Kong, you had the first modernist journal right, devoted to uh, all forms of literature, poetry, fiction, and so on. And there was a lot of interaction among these avant-garde journals. Okay, and then the third example is in the, um, in the 1970s, 80s, uh, even during the Cultural Revolution, uh, underground poetry um, was developing and in fact widely circulated uh, by hand copies and underground poetry during this period of time eventually uh, attracted national and international attention when China opened up in the late 1970s and 80s, and some of it was known as misty poetry, a term you may be familiar with. And then some of these um, publications and poets will play a role in this um, early period um, of avant-garde poetry. I mean, I like the term avant-garde. I also like the term experimental poetry um, because of its boldness, because of its, um, originality that was so different from the orthodoxy. Okay, and renewal of tradition beyond a kind of classic. So beyond what we have talked about, um, I also want to emphasize that um, tradition um, of Chinese poetry is um, strong and alive and growing. And it's because of the new contribution of modern poetry. In terms of language, it has really greatly broadened the, the scope, the, you can say the uh, expressive uh, range of the Chinese language. And I think some evidence of that is how modern Chinese poetry has begun to influence the Chinese language, the way we speak it, the way we write it, okay? And then in terms of form, that's pretty obvious since the modern poetry stays away from all traditional poetic forms, uh, whether it's um, the, uh, the shi or the si, right, the various genre. Um, but rather, modern poetry has created many, many new forms. Some of them were borrowed from other countries, um, such as the sonnet and the haiku, right? However, uh, there are infinite forms. Uh, in terms of modern Chinese poetry and structures feeling that is the living presence. In other words, it's kind of hard to describe this without concrete examples, but, but because of the, the um, modernity of, of the world in which um, we all live in, modern poetry obviously reflects that. It's a very different world, different consciousness, different worldview um, from what we find in the classical tradition. And finally, relations to music painting. We saw how uh, important poetry was in terms of paintings, classical painting, but also I think in modern poetry, you can identify important collaborations between poetry and painting, not to mention that some poets are painters also, and uh, photographers, uh, musicians, and so on. The music, I think what is often um, criticized, I guess what people, often criticize modern poetry for is that it's not musical. It's not musical only in a traditional sense that there are no rhymes, there is no predetermined prosody. However, there is a lot of music, a musicality in modern Chinese poetry. And even in terms of songs, some of the modern poems have been uh, turned into songs. Some have become quite popular. And in fact, music is a way to discover some modern poems. One good example is um, Mu Xing, uh, Cong Qian Man, um, Slowness of the Past, or Slowness in the Past, right? A poem that really very few people knew about until it was um, composed um, as a song. And now it's one of the very popular songs in China and beyond. So anyway, I think in, in all areas, we can see that modern poetry has contributed to a vigorous renewal of tradition. So I can stop here, or I guess I'll just look at this uh, couplet from a modern poem written by a million Chinese poet, Chang Yao, a really wonderful poet. Um, 
and uh, just the opening lines of one of his best known poems. Uh, and this is not a you know, um, careful translation, more like a paraphrase. We have agreed not to touch on the past that hurts. We only do small talk, we only view the fragrant grass. So even though this is modern poetry in terms of form, in terms of language, in terms of punctuation, which didn't really exist in classical poetry, um, you can see a close connection with the classical tradition. For instance, the, the setting in which the poem um, is written, it's really about a reunion of friends, right? So we agree not to talk about the past because that will only make us hurt, right? It will only bring us pain. And that really reminds us of Du Fu's poem, right? Du Fu's uh, poem about um, getting together with a friend who he has not seen in 20 years. And uh, when they talk about old friends, half of them, according to the poem, have become ghosts, right? In other words, uh, things that hurt. But also the second line, Fragrant Grass, the title of the poem, right? That reminds us of the Wang Wei poem, right? About saying goodbye to a friend and who knows when we will see that friend again, even though grass will grow back next spring. So even in these modern lines, uh, you, you hear echoes, echoes of the poetic tradition. There is no separation. It's not possible to separate the two. I guess I'll just stop here and uh, in an open-ended kind of way. And, and I welcome your comments and suggestions and criticisms. Wonderful, thank you very much. I was very fascinated, not only by the talk, but also by the by blending all these pictures, which really give <laughs> kind of much more sense and depth to, to everything. 